It's likely that you're waiting right now. You might be somewhere mundane, traveling, stuck somewhere, or maybe you're waiting for your life to change, for some sort of fulfillment to reach out and bestow you with purpose. But it's safe to say that life has a lot of waiting in it. Hitchcock famously said, Drama is life with the dull bits cut out. But are we ignoring an essential part of life by not showing ordinary moments? Moments where there's nowhere to go, or if there is, it's far away or impossible to get to. Writer director Makoto Shinkai explores isolation in all of his work this inability to get what you want and what people are forced to do in the meantime. When we form a goal in our minds, there's often a rush to have it. We know where we are, and we have a vague idea about where we want to be, and suddenly there's immediacy. <laughs> but what Shinkai minds like no other filmmaker is the drama in waiting. Part 1 of 5 centimeters per second follows Takaki, a boy who takes several connecting trains to meet his friend Akari. As if traveling isn't stressful enough, almost every one of his trains is delayed by a terrible snowstorm. Takaki has to deal with genuine uncertainty, battling schedules, weather, and doubt in an era without cell phones, which is why there are so many shots of his watch. On the opposite end, Akari is waiting for him to arrive, and both of them have to question if the other will be there. And despite reassurances, it doesn't really make it better. All of this makes a larger point, seen in parts 2 and 3, about the obstacles in relationships. It can be physical, like distance or death, or with the help of fantasy, switching bodies. But even when characters are in the same place, they can be at the mercy of circumstance. Though it's understated, in the Garden of Words, the lead characters are unwilling to act on their feelings of love because of their age difference. But Shinkai shows how people grow at different speeds. The boy, Takeo, is impatient to grow up. And the woman, Yukari, doesn't really feel like an adult at all. But their love doesn't go away, so they're caught between where they are and where they want to be, meeting in the middle when it rains. The rain can be seen as a symbol for their relationship. It's tumultuous at times, lonely, beautiful, but quite literally, it's something to look at while no one is saying anything while we, the audience, wait for something to happen between them. While I believe that mundane moments are an essential part of life, an audience's attention span can't be overlooked. Makoto Shinkai uses appropriate runtimes from 45 minutes to an hour to a traditional length. It's all about what suits the story. And honestly, when the images are this breathtaking, you can show them for any length of time. Shinkai's animation sets him apart from any other filmmaker, and it has nothing to do with his software because he uses commercial Adobe products, but simply his mastery of light and texture and photography. It might be weird to think of animation as photography, but understanding the way lenses and depth of field work is crucial to fabricate images. Almost every shot has a blurred element. This is the way we see, the way that cameras work, how we focus. Strong graphic design is said to be divided between foreground, midground, and background. Typically, the focus is on the midground, where most of the action happens. The background fades away, becoming lighter and lighter, almost blending into the sky. This is called atmospheric perspective, where distant elements look like they're receding due to the atmosphere or the weather. And to frame the shot, there's probably something in the foreground, a decorative element that the camera looks past. And it's blurred, so you're less likely to look at it. When you put all three together, you get something that looks photorealistic. Combining these separate pieces takes planning. So in this shot, several extras are waiting for a train to arrive. It seems simple enough. But take a look at the characters in the foreground. They've been blurred because the depth of field extends to the middle of the image. That may seem trivial, but in order to apply a blur to the characters without affecting what's behind them, these characters would have to be drawn on a separate layer, which shows how deliberate Shinkai has to be. It also helps the main characters stand out in crowd scenes. 
if all of the extras are slightly blurred, then the main characters take center stage. And the use of rack focus just makes it feel cinematic. What I love about Makoto Shinkai is that he keeps improving. His character animation has steadily gotten more naturalistic by color correcting the pencil outlines. In the Garden of Words, the backgrounds are heavily dominated by green, so half of the characters' outlines are green too, like the light is bouncing off of their features. And his rendering for water, for example, has gotten better and better. Traditionally, water is animated with three colors, a base color, or some kind of gradient, a shadow, and a highlight to indicate the motion of the water, and maybe some sparkles because it's an easy effect. There's nothing wrong with animating water like this, it's the standard. But in The Garden of Words, a film that's focused on immersing you in space, depicting water is so much more complex. Take one shot that lasts about four seconds. There's the surface of the water, refracted rocks underneath, subtle reflections of objects above the water, wisps of rainfall, individual bouncing raindrops, their single color reflections and ripples across the water. And just to combine all the techniques together, the background is out of focus. To me, it isn't just a visual treat, but it's necessary for Shinkai's storytelling. Part of his incredible realism comes from using photo reference, using real places in Tokyo to draw inspiration. But Agartha, the fantasy underworld and children who chase lost voices, doesn't have the same level of world building or visual interest. And there's so much emphasis on progressing through the story that I don't feel like I'm really immersing myself in a specific place. So it's easier to notice the derivative plot, the sporadic pacing, and the empty characters. His fantasy works better in the slice of life genre. In your name, Mitsuha, a girl living in the country, and Taki, a boy living in the city, trade places. This is relatively realistic. They wake up, live as each other, and they experience the intimacy of setting, family, and friendships. Mitsuha is stuck in the fictional town of Itomori, for her, a notably dull place to live. <laughs> The circumstances of our birth, our government, and most of our life is out of our control. But the characters that are eager to leave their situation and make such a fuss to do so are often the unhappiest. Part 2 of 5 centimeters per second is framed around a young girl vying for Takaki's attention. She waits for him so they can ride home together and tries to express her romantic feelings towards him, but his own fixation on the past prevents him from making a real connection with her. And as an adult, the further he gets from the day he took a train to Akari, the more isolated he is. He's depressed, he quits his job, his current relationship is falling apart. Akari, on the other hand, though not immune from the past, is able to move forward and get married. She's moved on, and he's still looking in the past. A dangerous thought is how pursuit can be mistaken for love. Morisaki journeys to the underworld to resurrect his dead wife his obsession leading him to make immoral choices for a goal that really isn't possible. And Asuna, who I think is severely underwritten and unmotivated, actually ends up serving the theme of the film. By not being so driven, she comes out with more to gain. When Taki makes it his mission to find Mitsuha, he's determined and focused, which only increases his worry, but his friends are just along for the ride. They gain the most by enjoying the experience of being there. It's only when Taki steps back and surrenders any kind of control that he gets the answer he's looking for. It's also why Shinkai's characters worry so much about their future career. In the span of a minute and a montage, Shinkai shows how stressful testing and planning for university is. Takayo is hellbent on living as a shoe designer. Taki transitions into the future by looking for a meaningful job. But what we want usually comes to us when we stop looking for it. Hmm. 
普通にずっとこの街で暮らしていくんやと思うよ、俺は。At the end of your name, Taki and Mitsuha desperately try to remember each other. 名前書いとこうぜ。ほら。Temporality is such a heavy theme of your name. We're meant to fall in love with a town that disappears in an instant. If we're unhappy in a lull, we probably won't be happy when we get everything we want. It doesn't diminish the necessity of planning, but the solution to waiting isn't patience, simply enduring where you are, but to genuinely appreciate and enjoy the life around you, even if it's dull. By showing us nature and rain and architecture and phones and signs and brands, even the fake ones, it lets us appreciate the present. And that's the power of animation. Characters can moan about how miserable a town is, but we're shown such beautifully animated places that I don't feel miserable at all. So, is real life subpar to animation? All films, even Shinkai's, truncate the waiting process of life. Months go by in an hour. The information is condensed to a palatable format. And sure, life doesn't quite glimmer like this, but I think animators like Makoto Shinkai teach us the appreciation of life. I could go on and on about the detail in the film, using brands and lettering so masterfully, but they tend to stand out because other animation doesn't do this. But why is a poster in real life so meaningless? Perhaps because we're used to life. We're used to its complex pinnacle detail that doesn't ever diminish. Animation does what no other medium can, it highlights what's already here. 